evening. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the American Islamic College Lecture Series program. Uh, if you could kindly just turn your cell phones off, we'll begin shortly. If you want to get second round, please hold your cell phones next to you. Thank you. We are so happy to have with us today Dr. Jermaine Lana. He is joining us to discuss the topic of race and the Muslim question. Dr. Junaid Rana is the Associate Head of the Department of Asian American Studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and also holds appointments in the Department of Anthropology, the Center for South Asian and Middle Eastern Studies, and the Unit for Criticism and Interpretive Theory. His interests include transnational cultural studies, diaspora studies, community organizing and social movements, critical and comparative race studies, political economy, the post-colonial state, South Asia, Pakistan, and the U.S. relations. He is the author of Terrifying Muslims, Race and Labor in the South Asian Diaspora. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Jermaine. Thank you. Um, Assalamualaikum. Peace and blessings to all of you. I just wanted to sort of open with that. Um, and it, it, just make sure it's okay. Make sure all the technical stuff is going. Um, so in today's talk, I wanted to um, start off by by introducing the topic. And of course, feel free to keep eating and grab more food as we go. Um, <clears throat> the reason I, I chose this topic um, in many ways reflects on the work that I did in my book, Terrifying Muslims, which was mainly about this central question. Um, how is it that in after can I interrupt? Sure, already? sure. Yeah, you can terrifying start. Terrifying Muslims. Uh -huh. Does that mean how to terrify Muslims or Muslims are terrifying? That's the whole point. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for, for bringing that up right straight at the straight. I mean, the double entendre is meant. Um, and part of the, the what I'm framing in the book is both how the, uh, the figure of the Muslim as a, <clears throat> as a, um, uh, a, a racial category. How does it become a racial category? But also, what is it? What is this fear that we're talking about? And, and in the the sort of, you know, one of the things that happened after September 11th, 2001, is that we began asking this question: What is Islam? Who are Muslims? Right. And in particular, in the United States, um, there was a way in which race became part of the question of how to think about Muslims themselves, right? And so in many ways, you know, you asking me straight off, I mean, I think that's perfect because that is actually the question, right? What is happening with, and again, when we think about race, we don't necessarily think about it as a religious category, the way we think about Muslims as a religious or a faith-based kind of category of identity. Now, race and the Muslim question, um, where I wanted to start today, is to, to really raise the question of, of what does it mean to racialize Muslims, racialize Islam. And, and if you can't see me or hear me, please join us at the table if you'd like. Um, there's, it, it's, it's actually more comfortable. The chairs are more comfortable. Um, so <clears throat> race and the Muslim question, at first is, is sort of a, a cheeky kind of reference um, that I was making in many ways to British colonialism. Mm -hmm. um, the Muslim question, as some of you who are, are, who are nodding in agreement, will recognize that under partition, before partition in the Indian subcontinent, one of the major ways that the religious divides under British empire were seen in, in, in um, what are now India and Pakistan and Bangladesh uh, and Sri Lanka to a certain extent, which was then considered Ceylon, um, was the 
the issue of Muslims as a different category from Hindus, right? Now, what for the British this brought up, and the British were sort of, you know, as part of the kind of empiricism involved in their imperial adventures, were constantly classifying and categorizing, right? So not only were they thinking in terms of like, well, what is the difference between a Muslim and a Hindu, but where are they coming from, right? And part of colonial rule under British, under the British was a sort of constant sort of, okay, so you're from certain language groups or certain ethnic groups, then how do I think of this, this group of people? And that was part of what the colonial project was, what we came to then know as divide and rule, right? So understanding how categories um, could be then used to then say, okay, person X is from this place, they speak this language, these are their customs, their traditions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this was actually a very ethnological, um, and as an anthropologist, this is a way that um, the British came to know about culture itself. And in fact, it wasn't just know about culture and study it, but to define it, right? So much of what we know in the Indian subcontinent between various groups of people, various practices, tradition, is codified and made a tradition much by, as much by British influence and the sort of study of these things um, as, as much as the people who are practicing it. So why do I make this reference to race? Well, in the British example, right, there were a number of ways that, <clears throat> excuse me, that race itself was understood. Race was understood first and foremost the way we understand it today in, in popular parlance <laughs> as a way to think about um, skin color and differences that emanate by, from groups around the world because of skin color. Like right. the Irish race? Of course, absolutely. Um, and and for, for Britain, the Irish were very much uh, the kind of, and Catholics in particular, I mean, it's not just Irish as uh, an ethnic category, but as a religious category, much like, much like the Jews or the Muslims or even the Hindus. But in the example of the Indian subcontinent, there, the Hindus were seen as a race that could be worked with, as opposed as having a, also a kind of civilization, right? And the British saw Muslims and the Muslim question not only as as sort of barbaric and more prone to violence, many of the terms that we now understand as in terms of how we think about terror and terrorism and the war on terror and all of that stuff, but we're seen as a kind of uh, uh, irrational, um, illogical, and even revolutionary, right? Um, because there were many in the Indian subcontinent at the time who were, again, the claim was being made um, as early as the early uh, 1920s to uh, a, a Muslim state, a Muslim um, uh, separate government, right? Um, so all of those things are, are one way to think about Islam and Muslims. But given our circumstances here in the United States, well, the question then is how do we think about Islam and Muslims in this day and age? I mean, all of us, in some way or another, have some kind of understanding. Okay, so the war on terror did a number of crazy things involving, you know, not only domestic surveillance, torture, um, torture um, war, um, whole scale violence that our government then um, contributed to and was the center uh, uh, piece of. But in our everyday lives, right, how might we think about? Those things that the government we often we often attribute to governmental practice, right? How might those things be seen as part of our everyday lives? Now, we have to kind of stop on that question and say, okay, there are a number of contradictions that I've already brought up. One, Islam and, and Muslims, they're not normally thought of as a race, right? And even in popular culture, we don't understand um, religious groups necessarily as racial groups. In the United States, when we think about racial groups, we usually think in terms of state categories, actually. We think in terms of census categories, African-American, Latino, Latina, 
um, white. Um, we think of, sorry, Asian American, um, South, and, and even all of those groups, we might even break into other groups, right? Um, <clears throat> but if we think e even, e you know, just in terms of our local understandings of race, right? In Chicago, right? Um, you have all kinds of uh, discussions. You'll have discussions about Irish people. You'll have discussions about Polish people. You'll have discussions about Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, Chinese, Japanese, Arabs, Pakistanis, Indians. You know, the, this kind of return, a, a, a use of a national kind of identification is often a way to think about ethnicity but ethnicity itself is a fairly recent, in terms of conceptual usages in the United States, it's really a post-World War II kind of conception, right? Um, in fact, the use of these categories of Italian-American and that kind of stuff emerged out of the shift, right, in U.S. domestic policy, in which race was common parlance before World War II, and then after World War II, the shift was towards ethnicity. Now, why did the U.S. government, why did people do this? Obviously, it was the Holocaust. Um, it was sort of, you know, um, being against Germany, being against uh, Japanese imperialism, and those kinds of use, those uses of race that said um, by fascist Germany and Italy and Japan, that said that there were particular racial groups that need to be annihilated from the world, right? And those racial groups were often defined by skin color, by certain ideas around biology, but also religion. You had a question. I feel that the, the American idea of what race is changed after the immigration law was changed that had preferred groups and unpreferred groups. Yes, I'm German, but I was still in a preferred group. So I got my immigrant visa within something like six weeks mm -hmm. when I had been warned that it would take a year or more. And here I was, was totally unprepared, but I came. Mm -hmm. But this thing that there are no longer preferred groups now, as many Indians and Africans can come in, which when I came was un unthinkable. We try to keep these darker skinned people out. And now that's no longer the case. I'll get to that. Um, actually, ac uh, what I'd like to do um, is to take us uh, actually way further back than 1965, which is what you're referring to, right. um, in terms of the Immigration and Naturalization Act. Um, certainly, you know, World War II, there were a lot of different acts throughout the 40s and 50s up until 1965 that led from um, what you're talking about, a shift from, um, from a quota system into basically a system that, that uh, was dominated by a preferential system around uh, professional, professionals. Um, but in many ways, that's immigration policy. I, 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 there's a lot to talk about there, and we can talk, certainly talk about that. But in terms of thinking about race in the United States, I want to start with this, this definition. I often use this definition. I use it in my book. Uh, it's by an anthropologist, Leif Mullings. Um, and, and it highlights some of the really kind of broad understandings of how we should think about how racism is attached to race, right? Because in many ways, racism is an act. It's a practice, right? It's something that happens not only in the everyday, but it becomes part of how we are um, structurally connected to each other socially, right? Um, and the, the category itself of race, right? And many scholars debate whether, you know, which came first. It's one of those kind of chicken and the egg questions. Historically, does race come first or racism? Um, I don't really take sides on this, um, but I would like us to think about the category of race itself, right? Because the category of race enables racism, right? And so Leif Mullings describes racism as a relational concept. Now, when it's a, as a relational concept, that means that racism and even the usages of race happens with, with, with groups of people who are connected to one another, 
So if we think in terms of stratification, the way that sociologists and anthropologists often think about social, social structures, right? Again, this ca these categories like Italian-American, Polish-American, African-American, these are relational terms so that we can understand how, for example, an Irish-American is racialized in relationship to an African-American, right? It is a set of practices, structures, beliefs, and representations that transform certain forms uh, perceive differences generally regarded as indelible and unchangeable in terms of quality. Just very briefly, just to summarize what that means, is that this is an everyday practice. It's not only something that happens at, at the state level through census categories, through forms of state violence and state racism, but in our everyday lives. We see and, and we understand that there are certain things happening. Right? It works through modes of dispossession which have included subordination, stigmatization, exploitation, exclusion, various forms of physical violence, and sometimes genocide. In other words, there's a range of violence that racism is responsible for. We can see it in everyday interactions. We can see it in um, sort of how we talk to one another to the points of genocidal sort of violence where we see wholesale extermination of groups of people. Racism is maintained and perpetuated by both coercion and consent and is rationalized through paradigms of both biology and culture, at least to varying degrees at specific temporal and spatial points which are woven with other forms of inequality, particularly class, gender, sexuality, and nationality. Now racism is really essentially just about inequality and maintaining forms of hierarchy, right? Now, so how does, how does Islam, Muslims, how does, how does this enter into the equation? Now, to think about it, um, one of the arguments I make in my book and I have made in, in, in relationship to an emerging scholarship on uh, Islam and Muslims and the racialization of Islam and Muslims is to say that 9-11 wasn't really, you know, 9-11 was kind of uh, one of the points on a longer history that we can take back pretty far, right, in terms of thinking about the process of racialization of Islam and Muslims. Now, the, now, racism itself, I mean, they're one of the things that's clear in the literature, and scholars have pointed out that you don't need a concept of race to act in racist ways, right? So this is to say that, okay, if I caught, you know, it, 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 it means that if, if you think you're conscious about racism, Right? Like say, for example, we often think that racism is relegated to white supremacists. Right? So when we think about something like Oak Creek, where a clear white supremacist was going after Sikhs because he thought they were Muslims and started gunning them down, that, that form of violence is what we would call racism. However, right, th th does that let us all off the hook if we're not acting in explicitly white supremacist ways? I mean, that's the question. right? I would argue that one of the things that happens with the race concept itself is that there's various forms of mutations in this concept, right? And how we get to the point where in the United States, in this day and age, where we have uh, a black president, President Obama, we can still see rampant racism all over the place, right? that the election of Obama does not necessarily mean that we live in a colorblind society or that we no longer see race at all, right? In fact, if we turn to the history of, of race, we would see that race in, in many ways is complicit and has, was sort of origin, the origin of the race concept itself had a rela relationship to Islam that we can see as part of a continuum of how, how I'm getting to it. Well, I was You're already to... asking the question. I'm getting to it. Don't worry. Um, no, I was going to say more is sure. the very term that really means Muslim. But when you say something, someone is a more, at least in Europe, to think of a black person. Exactly. Well, I mean, th that, that kind of shift uh, between more being classified as part of blackness happened after the 15th century. Yes, yes. Right. Um, so let me, so, so to get, you've already picked up on it, right? You already know where I'm going. 
So the part of the argument here is that race, right, the way the, the, the category that we came to know, right, really has its origins um, in 15th century Spain, right? And part of the argument that happens with many scholars of race in terms of this history is to look at the points of contact, right? When <clears throat> Spanish explorers were coming to the New World, right? And seeing indigenous people for the first time who they thought were, some of them they thought were Arabs and Muslims, right? Um, and part of that point of contact, the story goes, is that in that, in that moment that they saw indigenous people, they saw them as non-Christians, they saw them as heathens, and people to bring into the, the church, right? And very explicitly the Catholic church, right? And as they were bringing them into the church as new followers of Christendom and part, and, and part of, of Christendom, um, that they were then being sort of understood in very particular ways. Now at this point of contact, it was, race wasn't about skin color explicitly. Right? It was about religious belief. Now where did these ideas about religious belief come from? They had a lot to do with this slide I have up here that shows you the differences um, between sort of the, 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 the point of Christian states and Islamic states, right? The reach of the Islamic empire before the Moors were pushed back, right, by Catholic Spain, right? And once Moors were pushed back and were kicked out of Spain along with Jews, right, this entire area became sort of pushed sort of further and further south, and all of these kingdoms and areas shifted. Now, what's important here, I'm going to try to go through this a little bit quickly because I've already gone through 20 minutes and I have a lot of conversation, a lot, a lot to talk about. <clears throat> Is that um, you know this, these are just the various trips to Columbus to, to Caribbean, but what was happening, right? At least in the point of, of Columbus and and many of the explorers who were going there, and we have evidence from their diaries and many of the things that they were writing in terms of what they were seeing, um, in terms of as they were seeing these indigenous people in the New World. Who are they comparing them to? But to the Moors. Right? They were comparing them to the Moors to think about, well, okay, who are these people? Right? What, what are their religious beliefs? What is their culture, quote unquote? Right? In all of these areas, right, the comparison was to the Moors because, again, the Moors were the other of Europe right? and continue in many ways in the way we think about Muslims as the other of Europe. Muslims were also the, the other of the new world, right? So in comparing, just for example, um, indigenous people to the Moors, they would say things like they practice polygamy, even though, you know, they weren't, they didn't have similar kind of marriage practices. So that's, you know, th these were how they were interpreting, right? Native Americans or indigenous people, right? They were seeing them as, oh, they look like the Moors. They have skin color that, that approximates the Moors. Right? And again, this kind of this idea of what was at this point, right, in this, this kind of uh, these dual empires between Christian and Islam, there's a formation of the Moor as a kind of category of brownness, right? That in Spanish that it referred to a kind of a, a tawny color that referred to leather, right? Um, but then that word then became, not only did it, it its um, meaning become attributed to that kind of coloration, but it, it gradually shifted towards blackness, right? And towards the idea of blackness associated with black Muslims from Africa, right? Very specifically, right? So there was a, a, a spectrum. And this is interesting to think about because, when again, when we think about race, when we think about the word black, right, when we associate black with Africanness, right, that's a range of coloration, but yet black is this kind of monotone that we just understand, or so yellow with um, East Asia, or brown with, with 
um, parts of South America and Mexico and parts of, parts of South Asia, right? So those colors, even though they're a spectrum, right, we have this kind of idea of, of a monochromatic racialization constantly happening, right? And this happens at least half a millennia ago, right? So part of the concepts that we're dealing with now have had over a life of five to 600 years, right? So, right, the slave trade, essentially for the, for the Americas, solidifies race as a concept. And part of the legacy uh, in the United States is, is this idea of the slave trade being centrally part of how we think about race, right? Now, just to sw quickly go back to this slide, because the precursor to slavery is obviously indigenous peoples, right? There are indigenous peoples who were living here for many, many uh, years before the 15, slave trade. 000. Sorry? 15,000 or something like that? Sure, and, and part of the, the pre-slavery is to think also about how um, genocide of indigenous peoples sort of then brings in the possibility of enslavement of African people, right? <clears throat> Um, you know, and the numbers obviously range in terms of like, you know, the, the numbers in terms of who, indigenous people who were, who, who died through, through various disease, through war, um, there's a whole range of that. Um, but here, these are, these are kind of the, the, the numbers around the slave trade, uh, and these are very conservative numbers, but in South America, if you look at these numbers in terms of Brazil, 5 million, um, parts of the other coast of South America, half a million, and then North America, we usually think of North America as the, the great bearer of slavery, but it is actually South America that had much larger numbers. But if you also look at this and you add 20%, right, because this is what scholars say, it's at least 20% of all those um, slaves coming to the Americas, every single one of those numbers, around 20% is how many of them were Muslims, right? So then we start to see that there is a long history of how Muslims were coming to the United States, right? And the numbers are dramatic in terms of thinking about the history and the legacy of Islam in America, right? It well predates you know, our modern kind of understanding of immigration, right? Because, you know, slavery also has that legacy of stripping identities from enslaved um, Africans. So if you were a Yoruba speaker, but you practice Islam, both of the, those things were stripped from you. Your, your Islam was stripped from you as much as your language was stripped from you. And it's not really until um, the 18th and 19th century that we began to see a return, if you will, to various forms of Islam through the Moorish Science Temple, through other kinds of practices that we see living and still thriving even today. Another kind of map uh, in terms of thinking about um, this kind of moment. Now, I, I've got a, I'm so running out of time, and I had some, I have a couple other slides I want to get to that are kind of more sort of the modern moment. But what, you know, thinking about race in terms of African American Islam, in terms of thinking about um, sort of Native Americans that preceded um, slavery, and how that trajectory gets us to think about, right, um, not only how the United States is formed, Right? Because, you know, in terms of thinking about um, American capitalism, the, the growth of and wealth of what was to become America happened through forms of exploitation, right? It happened through sort of, you know, taking from Native Americans and then using African um, enslaved labor, not as wage labor, but as slave labor that is sort of, you know, seen as kind of a... a uh, a labor that's free, that's free, that doesn't cost anything to the slave owner, right? Um, now what I want to switch to is to get us thinking about 
Now, what, what happens in 9-11 is that there's multiple ways that um, Islam becomes racialized. And why do I show, this is a, a classic image of a Sikh um, um, taken by the, the great Asian American photographer, Corky Lee. And if you, you don't know of his work, he's one of the great Asian American photographers. Two of the, the, the really important sort of lines of, of his photography is he shot, shoots a lot of sort of social movement activity, protests, uh, people with banners. Um, and what he's really good at in here, this is a protest and a vigil um, from Central Park. He shows these moments as really key historical moments where something's changing and shifting, right? And what he also does is he, sh he, he takes pictures of a lot of religious ceremonies. So one of, the, one of the interesting things that he captures through his photography is he shows how religious meaning, religious identity is, is interwoven with racial identity, right? So in this image, right, as Sikhs are mourning the losses of what happened at 9-11, there's also a way in which this image in particular sort of tells a story of racial violence that Sikhs fa will face and are always have been facing for a long time, right? Right after 9-11, some of the earliest forms of violence that happened across the United States were against Sikhs, right? Because they were interpreted, because they wear turbans as part of their religious beliefs, that they were interpreted as Muslims, right? And here's another uh, picture um, a few years later by Corky Lee. Um, the annual Muslim Day Parade, right? Sort of reclaiming space um, in Manhattan, I believe. I'm not totally sure about that picture, where exactly it is. But again, uh, the annual Muslim Day Parade that happens in New York, right? So when we look at these two images, for a lot of people, these two groups of people are indistinguishable, right? Sikhs, Muslims. They're different religions. They're, here we have actually a multiracial um, group of people, right, multiracial in our conceptions of, of how we define race in the United States. And that's the thing, right? Even though we might see this picture of, of men praying as a multiracial group of Arabs, of South Asians, of, of, of white converts perhaps, of African Americans, that in important ways, right, these two groups of people become racialized. It's not moving, but they become racialized in similar ways, right? Um, and how does that happen? Well, this is the part of the logic that's always been in operation: that race is a flexible concept that allow that that can be placed on a number of groups of people simultaneously. When we say the category African American, South Asian American. Latino. We're using that to define numerous groups of people who have various kinds of differences already by their own background, by their, by their religious beliefs, their cultural identity, social identity. But yet race as a form of social structure would place these groups as similar or the same, right? And that's what happens with Islam and Muslims. So why don't I pause there and we can open it up for questions and um, comments. I know there's a lot that people want to ask, and perhaps um, we can we can do that in the Q and A. Anyone? I don't have yes. A do you have a question? Go ahead. No, I have a comment. I, mm -hmm. I'm from West Africa, mm -hmm. and for the first time, I, I got a video from the Kitabu uh, Public Library about Rwanda, mm -hmm. and I saw for the first time I got to understand. The, the impact of colonialism yes. by the Belgians, mm -hmm. and these people describe how they will measure their ears, yeah. their noses, and their color to kind of categorize them. Yeah. And uh, like, oh, if you're tall enough, and your nose was a little bit straighter, or your ears were, oh, you can work with them at home. And if you were short, you could work in the farms or something. So they created sort of a, uh, an enmity between these two. They're just ethnic groups of people in the same country, mm -hmm. but over the years, they kind of yeah. developed this hatred among themselves. Sure. Like, we cannot let the short Hutus or 
rule of. So right. I understand when you're talking about the Indian, the way um, yeah. Yeah. Indian colonization and how long that lasts. Yeah. You know, what would you call that? Is that well, I mean, yeah, so one of the things that, you know, the legacy of racism is, is scientific racism, right? This idea that science could evaluate the differences between humankind, yeah. right? And one of the things, one of the sort of legacies of the Enlightenment was, again, and it was used through colonialism, and it's used today even through genomics, right? When we think about the kind of studies and the way people are thinking about DNA, right, something that that is so, you know, it's so infinitesimal, but at the same time, DNA is being used in very much the same ways to think about, you know, height differences and those kinds of categorizations. And the way that we would think about, well, how do we differentiate, differentiate different populations, different groups of people? That, especially in the case of Rwanda and Burundi, where we're, we're talking about people who visibly should not be distinguishable. But yet, because of their social, political, cultural practices, that then becomes this whole kind of ideology around their differences. And I think that's, that's a, a perfect example, again, of, of the kind of thing I'm talking about, where we see you know, not only the American form of how race and racism is practiced and how it's part of a racial hierarchy, that if you're an immigrant coming to this country, you don't understand it necessarily. But for example, in the South Asian case, you might already have some ideas of difference, right? Okay. We, all have, we all have ideas of difference that we come with as immigrants. But then when we're here, there's already a racial logic already in operation, right? We know who's at the top and who's at the bottom, right? And we know this because it's shown to us not only in everyday life, but in popular culture, um, through you know, our workplace, through our social networks, through our places of worship, these things are, are kind of reproduced, right? Um, and that's kind of one of the issues here. Yeah. So I feel whenever there's a questionnaire where my race is asked, mm -hmm. I say human because all the rest is baloney. Sure. Uh, scientifically. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, but that's, but, but see, here's the problem. If, yeah. if, we think that we live in a, a colorblind society, and I totally agree with you that racism is baloney and the idea of race is baloney. But on the other hand, that doesn't get rid of the concepts no, of race I, and racism. I was going so to, talk to actually be anti racist, we have to take on race for what it means. I realize that. Mm -hmm. No, what I was going to say is uh, my daughter <clears throat> is 50% German. And maybe 35% African American and 15% Native American. And so she's everyone she got. And after 9 11, the blacks on the South Side, several of them, threw stones at her and said, You, you filthy Arab, or something like that. Now, uh, when we belong to the India Association, the Indians at the association would always ask her, where in India are you from? And when we were traveling in Germany, a Turk spoke to her and said, are you from North Africa? So we bring to it something. Yeah, and my absolutely. grand, now my daughter married a German like me. Mm. After they're also Afro-German. So my daughter defines mm. herself as Afro. My granddaughter looks like her father and like I. She doesn't have She's as, if white is the word, she's mm -hmm. as white as anyone who's white. She has blue eyes, she has straight hair, even though her mother has none of these. Yeah. And she, at two, said to her mother, I love you, but I love my daddy better because he's like me. Mm -hmm. And that is something, so yeah. she had already absorbed the values yeah, she was of social race. Into, uh, and yeah. I find that is tragic. Yeah, and, 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 and I think so that's... hard for my daughter. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's interesting, I mean, you brought up two really great points. One, you know, how we think about mixed race people, right? Um, the idea of intermixture. Yeah, percent human. Absolutely. But yet, nonetheless, we are constantly thinking through racial, and it's not, you know, in many ways, um, you know, what you're, you're arguing and, and saying is that, you know, there has to be kind of a humanist point of view where we're t treating each, each other in kind of um, 
a, a fair and equal way, right? regardless of where we're coming from. And that's true. But on the other hand, how do we deal with those people who would say, well, who cares about human rights? Right? Um, and I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get further in life. Right? Now, that's, that's the, the, essentially the problem here. And I'm, I, like you, share your values of humanism, but there are a lot of people who don't, right? So for, so for us to think about what is happening with um, those other groups of people, we can't just write them off as ignorant or, because they're, 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 the ones, there. they're there and they're contributing to violence in society, right? So how, if we are serious about ending violence in society, how do we deal with that? Well, it starts with talking about what are they doing? Right, control, power, um, what are the things that they replicate? How does it benefit them and not benefit us? Right? Because in many ways to be a humanist, it's a lot harder. Right? It's more complex. It's more complex, of course. Yeah. Well, especially when you see that sort of racism even within racism. Sure. Interracial racism, sure. Even within families. Sure, and within I'm, families. I'm saying to yeah. my sisters, I'm married to this guy from Cameroon and Say drive, and I would say, you see a cab driver. Right. <laughs> right. It's just, I think we have to deal with it individually, like if it's subjective matter, you study it yourself, and then your family, and then you tell that group, but it would, I don't see it becoming a perfect or realistic way to right. do that. We have to do that. But I know African American families in which the lightest child is the good girl. I still remember my daughter's father when I said, well, when she gets older, it's probably going to, her hair is probably going to become more curly. And he said, no, she has good hair. So he had absorbed this value. He called his hair yeah. bad. Yeah. And that, I think, is what is so damaging. Sure. That, and, my, that my granddaughter felt if she was like her mother, she was worth less. Yeah. yeah. And so she asserted, I well, am I mean, worth less. See, see this is, that, that was the second thing that you brought up that I think is really crucial here. And that's how these things, we become socialized with these things at such a young age. And so, you know, often when I give these talks, it's remarkable to me how many parents come up to me and say, my child is saying some of the things that you're talking about, and they're like five or six or they're four. Yeah, that, it's very, yeah, okay, two years old. I mean, it's very early when we start to see these kinds of differences. So how do you, as, you know, not only someone who's been socialized with that world, and have thought about it. How do you? What do you do with your children who are doing that? And then, how are you in terms of what are your everyday practices to kind of respond to that? I mean, it can't just be that. Oh, we're not. We're not going to address this, or we're going to say to that child, <clears throat> excuse me, that you shouldn't think that way. Right, you're wrong. You're wrong, because then the child's going to be like, okay, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not. Maybe I have to lie to my parents because they are exactly. uncomfortable with it. Right, and maybe I'll never say anything like that to my parent ever again, and I'll just keep on thinking what I think, right? So this is a systematic kind of form of socialization that we are all sort of entering, right? And that in many ways, right, even the association of sort of class or status and that kind of stuff is part of these hierarchies, right, that we have to sort of confront in terms of thinking about. I mean, even even someone the the election of Obama. I mean, there were all kinds of racial tropes being as associated with him. One Still. of them being Islam, right? That yeah. because his middle name was Hussein, he must be a Muslim. He's one of them, and the other one being a socialist. I mean, that's that's you know like that. Those are the two worst things you can be. You know, that says yeah. something yeah. in terms of well, what is it that's being replicated in terms of when we think about well, how racism puts up a system that is based on a kind of eugenicist model of scientific racism. But for most people, scientific racism isn't viable, right? They'll say, well, I'm not racist. I don't believe in the science of racism. I only believe in humans, right? But even this notion of multiculturalism that we often say is the way we should be thinking has its own forms of cultural racism associated with it, right? What is cultural relativism? Something that the discipline of anthropology is supposed to practice, but you know it's problematic. Um, but a form of multiculturalism that says everybody's okay, 
right? We just have to respect everybody, but then there are some good practices and some bad practices, right? I mean, we'll say some parts of the world need to be, you know, we need to send our military there because they have bad practices. And what does that mean? I mean, how do we decide this? And who gets to decide it? And on what basis? On the basis right? of power. <laughs> Certainly. I mean, it is the basis of power, but it's also what we think power is, right? Is it just something that the President of the United States has, or is it something that each of us in this room has, right? And if each of us in this room has power, well, what do we do with it? The, the what? Life, I, I haven't read it, but I, I know about it. Yeah, most of this stuff isn't. I mean, um, one of the one of the more interesting books that I just read, um, I forget the names of the authors. It's two sisters. One's a, a sociologist, and the other one is a historian at Columbia. Uh, but it's called Racecraft. It's a, it's a brilliant book. It's actually very accessible. Um, and what they the 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 authors do, um, very similar to kind of Freudian sort of. Uh, ideas in terms of doing a psychoanalytic reading of, of how race is deployed is they compare racism to witchcraft, which I thought was actually really insightful. Um, and they, they deploy this term called racecraft, which is kind of this idea. So like, what do you do in witchcraft and magic but conjure things, right? And race is a conjured kind of ideology. It's a conjured form of difference. And so they, they argue, and, and it's really a very accessible book where they look at, you know, um, employment figures, they look at um, uh, violence, they look at neighborhood statistics around people where people live, and they use that to look at sort of the historical practices of not only racial segregation, but how, um, again, when we talk about this long history that I just covered in like 20 minutes, Right? How we get to this point where we have these, these ideas as part of our own kind of social ideas of, of how race is sedimented in everyday life. Right? So when we think, like here in Chicago, when we hear about gun violence, right? gun violence is certainly, yeah. um, <laughs> gun violence is certainly um, something that is, is a racial kind of uh, deployment. We think about it in certain parts of the city. We think about it, certain kinds of people doing it. We think about it as a form of, kind of a certain kind of racialized masculinity as well, right? We see, think about it as certain age groups, right? Um, and in a very, very, you know, racially segregated city like Chicago, we we get into these comfort zones where we can't talk around. We talk around race, but not across, sort of. How, how we can talk around across racial lines, right? So what does it mean to be, you know, to, to feel endangered or f feel fear of gun violence, right? And what does it mean to be in a neighborhood like that as opposed to where some of us might live? Right? And so what did you say? Excuse me? Where, where is the school? What, what city was that? The, the Newtown. 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 Yeah. My friends in the suburb, like you should move to the suburb. Then now, when that happened, I was like, that happened in a nice, suburban yeah. school. So it's Oak Creek it's was also a, a suburb, right? Yeah, I mean, so the Sikh temple. It's not, it's, mm -hmm. it's not a place. It's just yeah. I mean, suburbs have their problems as well. I mean, they're the mosques that uh, we have in Chicago are constantly facing all kinds of of, of violence. You, you know. Yeah, what did I say? You just said the mosque in Chicago. And oh, I met the suburban mosque, yeah. Right. 
Other comments, commentary from people in the back? Things you wanted to bring up? Talk I was about. having a conversation yesterday, and one of my Hispanic uh, Muslim friends said, uh, when she gets this Latino guy who wants to do Dawa, everybody's hoping they will build an Islamic, um, a Spanish speaking mosque. Mm. And her argument was, it, it, would that promote Islam or would it be against the main idea of Islam that mm. people should worship in the same? People from different ethnic groups mm -hmm. should worship in the same environment and intermarry. And so, do you think if we have like um, ethnic based mosques like the Pakistani mm -hmm. or the Yoruba, the Nigerian? Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't that be better for those who don't even speak English or understand English to promote Islam? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a complicated issue. And I think. Um, you know, historically, at least in the latter part, and this comes sort of post-1965 in terms of the formation of the majority of the mosques that are out there now, um, there was a period in which, you know, the, the mosque was, you know, anybody came who, and it was you know, sort of multi-ethnic, multi-racial. Um, and then there was another period, more around the 70s and 80s, where a lot of sort of, um, Mosques became organized around particular language use, right? And there are a lot of mosques now today where you can go and, you know, the main sermon on Friday is one language and it's Arabic and another language, and then the 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 language the language being spoken most often in that mosque will be Arabic, another language that's not English, and perhaps English. So. Increasingly, there are mosques that are, you know, Arabic and English, right? Um, where where it is more of a multiracial makeup, and it's it, you know people of different backgrounds. Um, but that's more recent, um, and I would say those are those are in smaller it numbers. It takes more people and it takes time. Mm -hmm. But I think your point to your your friend who was saying that you know for Spanish speakers, I think language is a huge issue. Um, if, if particularly if you are not conversant in the language, if you're going to a mosque where you're not conversant in the language that is, is being spoken on an everyday basis, then there's the, all these forms of, there, there are all of these barriers. Um, and, and yeah, and I think most Muslims, you know, in the world, their first language is not Arabic, right? Um, so I think those are some important questions that I think if there are numbers of, of of Spanish-speaking Muslims in a particular area, it would make sense. But the, but it, it does become a problem. Then how do you then connect back to other communities? You know, how... how right. And in terms of, like, thinking about Dawa, how do you, how do you then, you know, make these connections? How do you then um, further these connections across, again, language barriers? Um, but I mean, I think these are important challenges for sure. But since ethnicity, being among people like me, whatever that may mean, mm -hmm. is comfortable. When there are enough of an ethnicity, I think it is normal that they would want to have a place to worship where everyone can understand everyone. Yeah. So I love AIC because of its eclectic mix, mm -hmm. but uh, that is because I'm totally fluent in English, sure. uh, mm -hmm. but I might want to have a German Muslim community sure. if my uh, command of English weren't that mm -hmm. uh, comfortable. Yeah. And since it does not matter in Islam which race you are, or at least theoretically, uh, I think then it should be also perfectly all right for, uh, for Pakistanis to stick together but welcome other mm -hmm. Muslims. Mm -hmm. and, but to have a predominantly, predominantly one kind of ethnic mm -hmm. kind of mosque. Mm -hmm. In my home city in Germany, there are now three mosques, two Turkish ones, because the majority of Muslims in Germany right now are Turk, mm -hmm. and a so-called German-speaking mosque in which the preacher speaks in Arabic. Mm -hmm. 
but that has the Syrians in it and a few German yeah. converts yeah. and some Africans and just all the rest. Yeah. I mean, in many ways, this, this, this question and debate, I mean, is often um, placed on university campuses too, where, you know, um, students of color who want to, you know, organize or, you know, create a, um, a group based on their background, whatever it might be, right, whether it's Muslim or African American or whatever, there's always this kind of, you know, this um, critique launched at them as self-segregating. Mm -hmm. Now, the question of self-segregation, I mean, it's a very specific kind of language that, that is used, right? Um, the question is, why do people want to form these groups? Well, often it's because they feel more comfortable. It's a space from which you can actually have different kinds of conversations that you wouldn't have in other circles, right? I mean, there's a reason for organizing in those ways. And there are also reasons, you know, um, that groups of people tend to also, um, on my campus at Urbana-Champaign, a lot of Muslim students often live in, or, or choose to live, they don't actually get much choice, but they choose to live in areas closer together. So they rent, you know, there's an apartment complex called the Blues. I don't exactly remember why it's called the Blues, but that's what the student call it. Um, and all the Muslims live there, right? And so why would they live there? Because it's actually right next door to the mosque, right? Well, it's, maybe it's, the mosque is right next to them. Well, I mean, it, there's, a, it, there's a pattern um, of, you know, people under, seeing that there was a, an apartment complex and they bought up apartment complex mm -hmm. and started renting to students. So it was actually planned, mm -hmm. right? And so all of that was planned with the idea the that... the mosque was there first? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The mosque was there first and then, you know, it just made sense to start, mm -hmm. you know, renting out places right next to the mosque. And, and the mosque is right next to the university. So um, you see these patterns all over the place. Yeah. But do you see that there has been a change in the rhetoric of uh, against Muslims? And what do you think that was, or not what do you think it was, but how do you think that changed? Well, there are a number of levels. That's a great question. Um, and in a way, I didn't have enough time to get at it. But um, there, you know, 9 11 can go back to, you know, sort of the first Gulf War. The first Gulf War can go back to, you know, a num, you know, sort of the Iranian hostage crisis and the revolution. Um, then we can even talk about OPEC. Then we, I mean, we can go back each, you know, sort of decade in American history and talk about major events that really shifted how, you know, in popular culture and how people on, uh, at an everyday level were treating this question and, and certain, certain way of thinking about the racialization of Muslims. Um, but I think it's a very much of a, a, you know, a solidification really happened in the 20th century. Um, and it happened partly because of the, the early arrival of a number of Arab and, and Indian Muslim immigrants in the, the early part of the 20th century, the latter part of the 19th century. Um, and, and sort of that kind of, you know, and there are things like world fairs and the introduction of even the idea of Islam, right? I mean, there was a moment where Islam was kind of, you know, when we have people like Alexander Russell Webb, who was, you know, one of the, the first major white converts to Islam, who was also an ambassador and this important politician but in his time period, when we look at how Islam was thought of in the United States, it was very different than now, right? It was thought of as, you know, this exotic religion, this religion from, you know, it was, it was akin to a number of other world religions, right? And it was held on this stage and there was a kind of respect to, still towards it. But when we think about like how CNN and all the kind of news agencies now report stories about Islam, it's typically, 
anti-Sharia stuff, it's Quran burning. I mean, there, it's really all the kind of disrespect and the kind of um, the fear that's associated with a particular ideological point of view of how you think about Islam. But the, the shift that happened after 9-11, that was one of the major things, I think, that happened, right? You had this real shift in which Islam enters into mainstream conversations, into the public arena, but it also becomes this point from which to um, make an argument of how there's this invasion, right? Now this whole idea of invasion, this is, this, historically in US history, this has always been there, right? These perils, these panics, I mean, they are really, you know, when you think about the enemy, for example, the, the, the real precursor to the Patriot Act is the Enemy Aliens Act, which was really about, the Enemy Aliens Act was about the French, right? The idea that the French would come in the early part of, of the Republic and they were, they were potentially going to, to overthrow the government, right? And so that's, we're talking in 1798, right? Um, so these fears of like, outsiders coming in and taking over they're always there right so french then you had the japanese irish China. japanese yeah. internment um, but even before japanese internment you had you know anarchists russian anarchists who communists. communists who many of them were anarchists and communists right um and the red scares of the early part of the 1920 in the 1920s um the palmer raids and all of those things were basically with Russian exiles who were escaping persecution, right? Um, so, you know, there's that level, but then there's also, I think, the everyday level. I think one thing that has dramatically shifted after 9-11 is not only the level of everyday forms of racism, but the amount of violence, right? The kinds of hate crimes we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. Right, and this has been shown in terms of hate crime statistics over and over again. Now, part of that is because they weren't they weren't reported, and part of it was that it wasn't you know this the statistical way it was sort of captured in terms of like how it's counted was not being shown. But that part of what happens in this whole racializing racialization process is that there's somebody that becomes a threat and an enemy. And so that threat and, and, and enemy then becomes something that is going to be attacked, right? And so um, Louise Kanker, who did this, you know, wonderful study in her book, um, Homeland Insecurity, it took me a second, I kept, um, always get tripped up on that name. Homeland Insecurity, she has a chapter in her book where she did a survey after 9-11 to see who was getting attacked right here in Chicago, right? in various parts of the city. And what was interesting about this survey is that overwhelmingly, there was a huge spike in violence against Muslims, Arabs and Muslims, right, in the city. But what her study showed was that women faced it far more than men did, which goes also against the usual logic of how we think about um, hate crimes and violence against Muslims. Right? And what's interesting about that study is that, well, 